Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, and particularly our listeners in the British Isles, to this exciting and enticing game. And we have four enticing and exciting players who have played the game with great panache in the past, and we're thrilled to welcome them back because they're extremely talented at playing it. They're four of the finest comedians that we have in our country. They are Paul Merton, Julian Clary, Kit Hesketh Harvey and Linda Swain. And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score, and she will blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Arts Centre in the lovely town of Kings Lynn in that beautiful county of Norfolk and we have a humorous passionate Kings Lynn audience in front of us <laughs> ready to cheer us on our way right as we start the show with a Norfolk man himself who doesn't live very far away Kit Hesketh Harvey Kit the subject is my first job tell us something about my first job in just a minute, starting now. My first job was an apprentice to Nicholas Parsons, who, <laughs> before he rose to the dizzy heights you now see, majestic and bearing so much gravitas, was an artificial inseminator of pigs. <laughs> a task which is rightly performed with great momentum in this part of the world. He and I would set off with a spring in our step, armed only with our marigold gloves and a washing up bowl. <laughs> and a copy of Crackling, a lewdly pornographic magazine which showed pictures of Kevin Bacon and Mia Farrow in positions of enticing and exciting abandon. Now the thing about the porcine species is that the male genitalia is corkscrew shaped, so I would hold the animal down while Nicholas would spin like a Catherine wheel. While I was spinning like the Catherine wheel, Paul Burton challenged you. Not before time, I think, in view of what you were saying. Right, Paul, what was your challenge? It was a repetition of Nicholas. Yes, oh, I Lord, know. Oh, yes, we were, weren't I we? I know. Yeah. Some people say you can't have too much repetition of Nicholas, <laughs> but uh, um, I wish really I hadn't said it. It's a corkscrew shape. It is, actually. Yes, ask them. Ask them, they know. <laughs> So if a pig's having a romantic evening, they can open a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> it makes the wine taste a bit funny. <laughs> I think we should go no further down this particular line, though it is obviously highly appreciated by everybody here in Kings Lynn. Um, <laughs> Paul, yes, he did repeat Nicholas, so that is repetition, and you have a correct challenge, and you gain a point for that, of course, and you take over the subject. There are 14 seconds available. My first job starting now. My very first job, I think, was in the summer of 1977. I was working as a pub cleaner. I only lasted about six hours. I got the sack. I wasn't particularly good. And they paid me off with five pounds in cash, which I was particularly pleased with, because in those days... Um, Kit Hesketh Harvey Sorry, Shire. it's mean, but there were two particular lists there. Yes, was there were two they? particular lists. No, yes, sorry. indeed there were. So, Kit, you've cleverly got in with one second to go on a correct challenge of repetition. You get a point for your challenge and you take back the subject of my first job starting now. Our lives were in a rut. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point and it was Kit Hesketh Harvey who has two points at the end of the round to Paul's one. And Linda Smith, your turn to begin. The subject is... Belts and braces. Tell us something about belts and braces in 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. Belt and braces is a phrase that means to be very safety conscious, to be very cautious. And it's not, therefore, an epithet that could be applied to rail track at the moment, <laughs> whose somewhat cavalier attitude to the public good means that every journey undertaken in Britain is very similar to that rail trip taken by Omar Sharif in Dr. Shivago. Uh, Julian Clary has challenged you. Are we not? deviating. What from? From the subject. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a bit rich. Accused of deviation by Julian Clary. 
I think, Junior, you're right. So you gain a point for that. It's belts and braces and 38 seconds available starting now. I decided to dress for comfort to the journey to Norfolk <laughs> and I wore a pair of one-size-fits-all trousers. Unfortunately, there were no loops for a belt and there were no buttons for braces and I popped over the road to the newsagent before I got in the car and I came out of there clutching a bottle of mineral water and various things which I won't go into to amuse me during the journey. And do you know my trousers... Uh, Linda Smith challenge. <laughs> Were there two journeys? There weren't two journeys. The reason I paused, you missed the fact there were two trousers. But he didn't challenge what, on trousers, so legs. I can't allow it. So Julian has a point for an incorrect challenge, and he keeps belt and braces, and he has 15 seconds. <laughs> Thank you for applauding my wisdom. There we are. There we are. <laughs> 15 seconds, Julian. Belt and braces starting now. It was a kind of gangster rap look as they worked their way further down my thighs, but I thought I could carry it off. I thought, who cares if I'm 41? Uh, Kit has good Harvey Chan. So there were two I thoughts then. Uh, there were two I thoughts, I... definitely, yes. Seven seconds are available now. You've got another point, uh, Kit, for a correct challenge. Belton Braces is with you starting now. Belton is a charming village in the nearby county of Rutland, and the dentists there furnish the teenagers of that esteemed county help. Sorry, uh, two um, counties. Paul Challenge. Two counties. Two counties, yes, Paul. You've got him at. Half a second oh. to go. <laughs> um, belt and braces starting now. Just do them up. <laughs> so, Paul Merton speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point on that occasion. He's now equal with Kit Hesketh Harvey in the lead. Julian Clary is in second place, then Linda Smith. And um, Paul Merton, it is your turn to begin. And the subject oh, is. Oh, very topical. The Fens. <laughs> Tell us something about the Fens starting now. What can I say about the Fens that wouldn't immediately exhibit my ignorance about them? It's a wonderful part of the world. In fact, I... Um, can I He's exhibiting chance? his ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You live in the Fens and you <laughs> applaud that remark. Anyway, they enjoyed it so much. I'll give you a bonus point for your witty response. Uh, but it, it, weren't, it wasn't a challenge when the, the rules were just a minute. So Paul gets a point for being interrupted. He keeps the fens. Well, he doesn't keep the fens. He keeps the subject <laughs> of the fens. And 54 seconds starting now. Perhaps the <laughs> fenniest bit is about 10 miles from here. And it's so fenlandish that people just go <laughs> mad about it. So there's nothing like this at home. And they take photographs of the fens and they take, put water into us, special cups that they make out of knitting needles. Why is nobody challenging this? <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at me as if you're learning something. <laughs> Linda eventually challenged. Linda, yes. Well, all, all of them, probably. All of them, but hesitation's yeah. enough, isn't it? Right. 37 seconds. The Fens with you, Linda, starting now. The Fens are a lovely couple that we met on holiday when we were the tourists. They said they'd keep in touch with us, and sadly they did. So now we go everywhere with the Fens. I'm getting a little bit sick of them, to be perfectly frank with you. I cannot sneak out of the house without the Fens turning up. There they are saying, cooey, thought you were going out, thought we'd join you. So the Fens... Do um, Julian, clear it. Challenge. There were two thoughts. Yes, I'm afraid there were. So, Julian, well listened. Uh, another point. <clears throat> 16 seconds. The Fens are starting now. The Fens are a watery paradise for birds, and it's not generally known, but I was a duck in a former life. <laughs> I can't be more specific than that, but I know I had black and white feathers, and I lived on the Fens. I used to bob about, <laughs> and every Friday afternoon I would... <laughs> What a lovely picture he paints. And with that extra point, says the whistle when Green and Clary has moved forward. He's now equal with Linda Smith and Paul Merton in second place. Only one point behind our leader, Kit Hesketh Harvey. And Kit, your turn to begin. The subject, a false economy. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. In Cambridge, it's computers. In Norwich, it's insurance. Here in King's Lynn, we have a manufacturing industry catering to the local community, making prosthetic limbs, toupees, <laughs> glass eyes, <laughs> dental plates, wonder bras, and penile implants. We have, in short, a false economy. <laughs> if you go down to the back streets, of King's Lynn, and you should see a shop saying second hand, it means exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a lovely thought, right? Julian, you challenged. I hate to interrupt, but there were two King's Lynns. Well, then, then, sorry. Uh, there can't yeah. be enough King's Lynns, I think. Uh, no, there can't be enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
Julian, the correct challenge, 30 seconds for you, available still on a false economy starting now. False economy. I got a lift to King's Lynn today with Paul Merton's girlfriend. I thought that'll be a saving. But as we drove down the motorway, there was a brush with death. <laughs> Suddenly, she did a kind of S-shaped swerve, and um, I thought, oh, I'm going to meet my maker. Then she said, oh, I don't know what happened there. I think maybe someone opened the window, and the rush of air going out the window caused this... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I've done it back to him now. Window, I'm window. I'm sorry. The window, Two yes. Windows. Yeah, yeah there were four window, windows yes. in the Were there four windows in there? <laughs> <laughs> Nine seconds available, kid, for a false economy with you starting now. So if you should lose a part of your body through leprosy or just plain carelessness, come to the back streets of Lynn Regis, bishops of that nomenclature, as it was called. <laughs> So, Ketch has got Harvey speaking as a whistle when going the looks of wine and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Linda Smith, it's your turn to begin. Oh, the high jump. You have 60 seconds as usual, starting now. The high jump is a sport that I was actually quite good at at school, not because I'm particularly athletic, but I'm just quite tall. So I could just climb over the high jump. In the end, it didn't really seem worth having the competition. The gym teacher would just measure us all and the tallest one would win. <laughs> Invariably, this child was my good self. So that was the only sport that I was any good at. The high jump also means when, oh, you're for it, you're going to get into some kind of trouble. Um, and and this is not a... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton, new challenge. But it's an erm. Um, yes, there an was um. an erm, um, which but is... But I meant to say that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> which is in uh, hesitation. Right, Paul, you have 29 seconds. The subject is the high jump starting now. It's one of the great Olympic disciplines. In fact, one of the finest men ever to take part in the Olympian races, games, <laughs> if you like. Linda, got it back. No, I, look, let, take that back, because I thought he just... Oh, I thought he was going to say Olympics again. He said Olympian. Mm. Right. Masterly. Oh, oh, Masterly you didn't, you didn't want him for hesitation, so you know the first challenge is incorrect. Paul, you still have the subject. Another point to you. 22 seconds on the high jump, starting now. There was a man called Fosbury in the 1968 Olympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> Kit, you challenge first. Yes, <laughs> right, easy this time. 18 seconds, Kit, the high jump starting now. Any jump in Norfolk, of course, is a high jump because we have no hills. <laughs> but what amazes me is further up the coast towards Liverpool at Aintree. Uh, <laughs> Julian challenge. Hesitation. Yes, there was. Further up the coast yes, to I'm Liverpool. <laughs> and round. Right round the top and down the other side. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ten seconds, Julian, the high jump starting now. I've always been interested in the high jump and particularly fascinated by pole vaulting, <laughs> which in many senses is a close cousin of... <laughs> So, Julian Clary, speaking as a whistle, went again the next point. He's now only one point behind our leader, Kit Hesketh Harvey, and then Paul Merton and Linda Smith in that order. And, Paul, your turn to begin. My new hat. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Well, this is an extraordinary coincidence, because only three weeks ago I bought a new hat. I've never really particularly purchased a hat before, but this one was an absolute corker. I was going to meet somebody, and I was early, and it was raining, and I thought, well, I don't want to sit around getting wet, so I'll buy a hat. So I went to this hat shop, and I said, excuse me, do you sell hats in here? And the man said, well, we do. That's why we called her, you know, what I said before. And I said, OK, I'll have one. <laughs> and I bought the most beautiful thing. It looks like one of those Orson Welles hats. It's got a sort of black colour to it, there's a brim, quite a wide particular piece of cloth hanging over the edge there, and it looks like I'm selling port. It's a wonderful, beautiful, I'm, I'm quite romantic. Isn't it? <laughs> Kids has challenged you. You've had wonderful and beautiful before. Yes, I think you did have wonderful oh, you should see me in the hat. I want to, I want to. <laughs> Right, but you did repeat those words, so the repetition, a point to you, Kit, and the subject of my new hat, and you have 27 seconds starting now. Flanders and Swan, the great songwriters and lyricists of the 1960s, had a show called At the Drop of a Hat, which they followed with another, literally inserted into that phrase, Vieux Chapeau, old hat, it means an uh, old hat. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, you challenge first. Shouldn't it be VA? No. no. It's masculine, actually. No, it's masculine. It's vieux. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, something else then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were challenging for the, the, his, his uh, intellectual French. Well, I was, but <clears throat> I can change the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to be very quickly. Hesitation. No. I don't think he hesitated. <laughs> no, 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 no. And you can't have him on gender. I'm sorry. Mm. Not just... Who keeps pressing that buzzer? Kate. It's me. Um, yes, yes. I, I'm challenging myself for repetition of old hat. 
<laughs> well, as that now at last is a correct challenge, I'll give you a point Thank for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you keep the subject. Thank you. Because you challenge yourself, of course, naturally. What else could you do? 13 seconds. My new hat starting now. A phrase which is in contrast to new hat because the change of fashion in hats was very rapid and your hat could wear out before it had passed... No, wrong way round. Sorry. Paul <laughs> challenge. Hesitation. Absolutely. What rubbish were you talking about? I was talking about gibberish. Through my hat, I was talking about. It about happens. Through your hat. Right. Through your chapeau. Right. Four seconds. My new hat, Paul, starting now. £45, pounds, and I have to say it was very well <laughs> spent indeed. It looks wonderful. <laughs> so Paul Merton speaking as a whistle when got that extra point to increase his lead. Kit Hesketh Harvey is trailing him just a little and the other two are behind. And Kit, it's your turn to begin the subject. Oh, it's a topical <laughs> local subject which I'm sure you can go with your usual erudition on. Captain Vancouver. Tell us something about Captain Vancouver. <laughs> Are all the audience know about Captain Vancouver? Now let's hear the listeners can discover something from Kit on Captain Vancouver starting now. Well, here in Norfolk, we're surrounded on three sides by sea, so we're noted for the plenitude of our seamen. And one of these was <laughs> Captain Vancouver, who, like Admiral Lord Nelson over at Burnham Thorpe, was a county bred boy. He came from King's Lynn. He was a son of this fair borough, lived in a great big white house at the other end of the town from where we're now sitting and where a statue has been erected in his memory. He sailed up the northwest coast of a America all the way from San Francisco to Alaska, charting the archipelago, which is very complicated, that part of lineage. People thought he'd spat his tapioca out over the maps <laughs> when he brought them back. But what a hero he was. He also accompanied James Cook to Australia and New Zealand. And this lovely town in which I sit and uh, which I am a very proud citizen have every right to be glorious. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, so close. Oh, it's a tough game to keep going. The audience enjoyed it very much. But, Julian, you challenged with eight seconds to go. What was it? Oh, um, oh hesitation. Hesitation. Yeah. Yes, it was hesitation. But uh, well done, um, Kit. Uh, eight seconds. Will you tell us something about Captain Vancouver, Julian, starting now? <laughs> well, I'll try. I, uh, Paul challenged. Hesitation. <laughs> no! No. He, he just smiled and the audience laughed and he, he tried to pick it up. I don't know why they smiled, but, um, but maybe we'll discover in a moment. No, no, anyway, half a second, that's all. Give the oh, no. boy a chance to get going, really. <laughs> Six and a half seconds, Captain Vancouver Julian starting now. Well, I expect he had a beard and he changed his underpants every Friday. <laughs> Kit challenged him. He didn't, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nick, listen, did, he, what, what? did he have a beard or not? It's up to you. I uh, know about the beard. It was the underpants he challenged on. No, and, he, uh, he never and, changed his underpants. Well, nobody in those beard. days did change them no, very much. And if you're at no. sea all that time, of course yeah, you're... He didn't much have a beard. There's a statue of him. You can go look at it. But you challenged on the underpants. No, I challenged on the beard. Oh, I see. Mm. If you challenge on the beard, then I've got to give it to you, I'm afraid. Yes. <laughs> right. <so. laughs> I've right. always wanted you to say that. Was that a... <laughs> Why are you giving it to him? Because you said he had his beard. Well, did, we, we, all we've established is the statue doesn't have a beard, but it's very difficult to do beards on statues. That doesn't prove anything. I expect he had a beard at some time. Uh, or other. I, yes, actually, Julian, Julian, no, 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 I'm, I'm, always, <laughs> I'm always very fair. You have put into my mind a thought. I, I can assume that at some time during his voyage and his travels, he might have grown a beard. Oh, so, so, four seconds on. Captain Vancouver starting now. Captain Vancouver used to dress up as a woman every Thursday <laughs> and parade round the docks. Uh, Paul challenged. Deviation, it was every Friday. Yeah. <laughs> if you go see his statue, every Friday he's wearing a woman's dress. He used to change his underpants every Friday. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, I've got it wrong. Now, then. as far as I know, I can here say that he did not. He wasn't into cross-dressing. All those months citizen. at sea, you're telling me? Yeah. <laughs> Have he... you got any television? I know, but no, all those months, he, he didn't go. They never went. They hadn't got the, They couldn't put all the clothes into their seamen's chests. I beg, I beg your pardon. pardon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that he wasn't might have been into all kinds of deviation, but I, he didn't cross-dress while he was at sea. So I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Paul on this occasion. Paul, you have half a second to tell us something about cross-dressing. No, no, about... Um, <laughs> about Captain Vancouver starting now. He's known as the Mary of the Seven Seas. <laughs>
So Paul Merton speaks as a whistle. When gain the next point, he's just a little bit further ahead of Julian Clare and Kitty Harvey, who are equal in mm. second place. Linda Smith comes a little way behind them, and it is her turn to begin. And the subject, Linda, is garden gnomes. Tell us something about garden gnomes in 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. Garden <clears throat> gnomes are little ornaments with funny faces and beards, kind of idealised versions of Robin Cook. <laughs> My Auntie Helen liked garden gnomes. She collected them deliberately. Obviously, they didn't just accrue around her. But because she was a soft-hearted lady, she didn't like to leave garden gnomes in the garden. So she put them in her living room in front of the TV. V. Hordes of them. She was sweet, but clinically mad. And I suspect that any genes I have inherited from her would not be of the good variety. John Major's parents famously made garden gnomes, although in a rather po-faced way he referred to them as garden ornaments. What a miserable sod. <laughs> <laughs> Julian Clary, you challenged. Two ornaments. Yes, mm. that's right. She didn't have ornaments before. Well, listen, Julian, 13 seconds. Tell us something about garden gnomes starting now. I've no time for garden gnomes. I think it's a sign of bad taste. And whenever I see one, I feel obliged to kick it in the head, <laughs> and knock it over and roll it round and down into the lo local ditch. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, you challenged. A general petering out. Yes, well, here's a taste that they call that. So you've got the subject back, Linda, of garden gnomes with three seconds to go, starting now. Garden gnomes are delightful, quite in contrast to what Julian... <laughs> So, Linda Smith speaking as the whistle went and gained other points in that round as well as the one for speaking when the whistle went and uh, has leapt forward. Uh, but unless she's still in fourth place. But uh, <laughs> she's... Um, but no, no, no. I mean, the, it's the contribution, not the points, isn't it? And uh, only just behind Julian Clary and Kit Hesketh Harvey. And one ahead of them is Paul Merton. And Julian, your turn to begin. The subject, magic. Tell us something about magic in 60 seconds. You, you were absolutely mesmerised then, the audience was. I said, I really had them in the palm of my hand for a moment. The magic, Julian, 60 seconds, starting now. Magic. Well, I'm a member of a coven comprising of me, Lily Savage, Richard Whiteley and Anne Robinson. <laughs> And we're responsible for an awful lot of magic. I don't do my own ironing, you know. Oh, no. We just chant round the pot and suddenly it's all done. We do a lot of good things. I'm actually responsible for Dale Winton getting a third series of The Other Half. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. And we can do anything you want, really. You just write in to us and tell us about your troubles and your traumas. Uh, uh, Linda smith A uh, Lot of usses. Yes, it was us, yes, us, Quite us, a few. us, yes. Yes, I mean, once you let it go, but two or three times. All right, Linda, <laughs> benefit of the doubt. Got to you... draw the line somewhere. Yes, mm -hmm. right. You really. And I've drawn it now for you, and you have 28 seconds on magic starting now. Magic is possibly the most irritating form of entertainment known to humanity, <laughs> and it has given the wretched Paul Daniels a very good career. Uh, Paul <laughs> Merton Jones. Paper tearing's worse. <laughs> I'd put that under allied trades. Would you? <laughs> So what is your challenge Paper within the Paper tearing's rule? worse than magic. Have you got a, a genuine challenge within the rules of just a minute? Uh, deviation. Why? Because I didn't agree with her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's you deviating, that's, isn't it, Paul? Well, it could be. Right. No, I disagree, Paul. You, uh, uh, magic is still with you, Linda, and there are 20 seconds left starting now. Magic shows <coughs> make my heart sink. Even as a child, they used to annoy me intensely. Of course it's not magic, I think. There isn't really a rabbit in your hat, you foolish old man who was just the cheapest one in the local paper that my parents could find to come and, so to speak, entertain us. I get... <laughs> <laughs> well, Linda, you won't be asked to the Magic Circles conference next year. And really, oh, but well. <laughs> and there we are. But your thoughts on magic kept you going until the whistle went, gained that extra point, and you really have leapt forward now. You are equal now with uh, Kit Hesketh Harvey, one point behind Julian Clary, and he's two points behind Paul Merton as we move into the final round. Paul Merton, your turn to begin. 
Practical jokes. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Practical jokes can often have a nasty, brutish kind of quality, can't they? If I was to wire Nicholas Parsons up to the national grid, there would be a tremendous hoo-ha from the audience, everybody rushing forward desperately to put the plug in before anyone else. <laughs> and it would be terrible to do such an awful thing. There was a practical joker in the 1920s called Horace Devere Cole who gained some no- notoriety for... Kiddos is Harvey Chandler. Sorry, no, 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 no. No, 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 variety. We call that hesitation. 37 seconds are available. Practical jokes is with you, kids, starting now. Inspected the entire fleet at Portsmouth, pretending he was an Indian Raja. My favourite practical joke is the one where you go to a group of workmen who are digging a hole in the street and tell them there's a group of students coming along dressed as... Uh, Julian Challenge. <laughs> Too Two many groups. groups. Sorry. Two groups, yes, yeah. right. Julian, you've got in on the last subject, practical jokes. 28 seconds available, starting now. I said to Paul Merton the other day, would you like to have a bite of my sausage? And do you know, it wasn't really a sausage. It was a saveloy. You should have seen the look on his face. He was mortified. He said, does this ruin me for married life? I said, no. (laughs) (laughs) I've never seen you dry yourself up with your own... Perverse thoughts, actually, Julian. Right, uh, Kit, you challenge. Yeah, I was Paul Martin, you're a man or a mouse. You're, you're going to take all this. It's libel. <laughs> it's libel. <laughs> but you didn't challenge for libel. I mean, you know. No, I wanted to know what I'd done. I thought maybe I'd. What are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> I just dropped my hanky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you had a correct challenge, and you have ten seconds. Tell us something about practical jokes starting now. You tell them there's some policemen coming along, and in fact they're students. Then you tell the... Uh, poor challenge. <laughs> you did say students You did say students. You'll never get this story out, will you? <laughs> well, we'll have it after, after 60 seconds. Paul, you got in first. Practical jokes, six seconds available, starting now. One practical joke I heard about concerned Tommy Steele when he was appearing at London Palladium in the hit musical... <laughs> Paul Merton was speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point. So let me give you the final score, because alas, we have no more time to play this game that we enjoy so much. Uh, Linda Smith, who has triumphed admirably in the past, came uh, in just in fourth place, a little way behind Kit Hesketh Harvey and Julian Clary, who were linked together in second place. It's charming. <laughs> it's charming, isn't it? And a few points ahead of them was Paul Merton. So, Paul, we say, once again, you are the winner this week. <laughs> So it only remains for me to say thank you to our four delightful players of the game, Kit Hesketh Harvey, Linda Smith, Paul Merton and Julian Clary. We also um, must thank our lovely audience here in King's Lynn, but particularly I'd like to thank Janet Saplehurst, who helps me keep the score, blows her whistle so well, and our producer... Uh, Claire Jones, who makes sure that it all goes out smoothly with uh, some of the things that you may have suggested you might have heard, but, <laughs> but we're not like that. This is Radio 4. Nothing has to be edited. But we are deeply indebted to our creator of the game, Ian Messeter, and we are indebted to our lovely audience here in Kings Lynn. From them, from our panel, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Hope you tune in the next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs>